Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earlier crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. I'm going to be doing a little bit of watercoloring today with my Windsor Newton watercolor palette. I've also selected an Ulta new stamp set. This is the um, Magnolia Grandiflora. And the cool thing with Ulta new is they have all of these inspirations or this inspiration guide in all of their stamp sets. So it's kind of fun. I'm going to try and color this like a, a pink leaning traditional magnolia. Now the magnolias in my area are the ones that are kind of that creamy yellow color, but I didn't know how to make that in watercolor. I'm going to go ahead and stamp this in um, VersaClear Nocturne Black Ink and heat set it with clear embossing powder just to kind of protect the black lines and to give the each section of the stamp a little bit of definition. I will be coloring, um, because we're using watercolors, this will happen in um, stages, layers. I'm trying to get more patient and a little bit better with my watercoloring techniques. I'm gonna put the watercolor down, or the pigment down, and then use the water to pull it back out. Um, I do go through a couple of different size brushes, trying to find the right size brush, and I'm using my brother scan and cut to cut this image out because I do not have the coordinating dies. I think that's all about the coloring. So let's go ahead and jump into the crying. Our alphabetical journey today takes us to the state of Massachusetts. Now the area of Massachusetts was um, part of the original territory to the United States. It was originally included in the Charter of New England in 1620. The Charter of the Massachusetts Bay became the constitution of the Bay Colony in 1629. And then it became the charter that united Massachusetts, the, the Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth colonies in 1691. In 1785, that area was ceded to the United States to become part of the Northwest Territory. Massachusetts ratified the U.S. Constitution on February 6, 1788, and was the sixth of the original colonies or the original, yeah, colony should join the Union. <laughs> Sorry. Um, basketball was invented in 1891 by James Naismith in Springfield, Massachusetts. Also, volleyball originated in Massachusetts in Holyoke in 1895. It is illegal to make clam chowder with tomatoes in Massachusetts. The official state dessert in Massachusetts is Boston cream pie. The first subway system in the U.S. was actually in Boston, not New York City. The first computer that operated in real time was invented in Massachusetts at MIT. <clears throat> there is a state law that forbids snoring unless all of your doors and windows are locked. The Big Newton cookie was not named after Newton the scientist, but after a town, the town of Newton, Massachusetts. Boston Common was the first public park in America. Goatees are illegal unless you pay a special license to wear one in public. The first Dunkin' Donuts ever opened in Quincy, Massachusetts, and Massachusetts is home to a murder at Harvard where dentures make the case. Our story today is kind of long. I hope I can get it um, told concisely and without being too extra, too extra long. <laughs> and there are three major players, so we are going to take a minute and be introduced to all of them before we jump into the murder part of the story. We are going to start with George Parkman. Now, George was born on the 19th of February in 1790 in Beacon Hill, which is an area of Boston. His parents are Samuel and Sarah Parker, and he was third of their fifth children. However, Sarah was Samuel's second wife. Sarah, Samuel's first wife was also named Sarah, and they had six children before her death. George was born into a family of considerable wealth and influence in the Boston area and even farther beyond just their local neighborhood. George's father had created his wealth by buying up low-lying lands and income properties in Boston's West End. Um, Samuel also found and was part owner of the towns of Parkman, Ohio, Parkman, Maine. So he is making a name for himself in real estate. Samuel's sons from his first marriage oversaw the Ohio properties, while the sons from his second marriage were responsible for the main parcel. And Samuel's daughters also inherited wealth. 
George, though, <clears throat> was um, kind of a sickly child. Now, I did not read anything about an official diagnosis or if they were even sure of what it was. But his illness was a motivation for George to go to school to become a medical doctor. Now, check this out. In spite of whatever illness this was, George began his freshman year at Harvard in 1805 at the age of 15 and then delivered the salutatory orientation oritation, in 1809 at his graduation. Then he spent two years at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland to obtain his medical degree. So whatever illness he had, it clearly did not affect his, I mean, he's starting college at 15. He's, I mean, that's genius material right there, right? Anyway, um, George attended a lecture by Benjamin Rush and it inspired him to take an interest in mental health, specifically in the, um, the terrible conditions of the asylums for the mentally ill that were found in the United States. And that kind of leads me to think that maybe his illness was more on the mental health side. But that's just my opinion. So after George returned to Boston, he then took a trip to Europe traveling aboard the USS Constitution. And he was underneath this or under the supervision of Benjamin Thompson. I'm assuming he was still a minor at this point. And Mr. Thompson took him to meet minister to France, Joel Barlow, who introduced him to a lot of doctors in Paris. <clears throat> And while he was there, George actually observed some of the most pioneer and humane treatment toward in, in the treatment of mental health um, illnesses under the um, direction of two French psychiatrists. And he decided then that he was going to be, um, this was going to be his area of emphasis. He was going to study the diagnosis and treatment of mental health issues. So in 1813, George was called back to the United States for a military consignment during the War of 1812. He received a commission as a surgeon in a regiment of the 3rd Brigade belonging to the 1st Division of the Massachusetts Militia. He began in South Boston, and he simultaneously served as a phys physician to the poor, and he had a desire to replicate the practices and the medical things that he had observed in France. His theory was that mental health could be more effectively treated if mental hospitals were more like regular residences and the people, the, the patients who were there receiving treatment could be involved in their regular hobbies or regular pastimes, all of that stuff. On February 26th of 1816, George married Eliza Agnes McDonough, and they were parents of at least one son and one daughter. We could not find specific records of their names or anything like that. Um, George went on to be involved with the organization and publication of the New England Journal of Medicine and Surgery. So he had a lot to do, or he had a lot of involvement in modern medical practices. However, when Samuel died in 1824, George took complete control of the family estate and bought vast amounts of land and real estate in Boston, including many poorly maintained tenements. So money lending and real estate became the, um, it augmented his income. So he was not making a ton of money being the doctor to the poor people in the area, but the rental incomes from the properties kind of kept his family um, in a better than average lifestyle. And he also sold land to the city of Boston that would become the, the Harvard Medical School and the Charles Street Jail. Now, Harvard had a medical school building, but this was the home of the new building. So he is completely involved in his um, community. George was a well-known figure in the streets of Boston, which he walked daily to collect his rents. He was considered a thrifty man, and he did not even own a horse. He was described as tall and lean and had a protruding chin and always wore a top hat. Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. said that, quote, He abstained while others indulged. He walked while others rode. He worked while others slept. Um, Oliver's wife, Fanny, quoted Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and called him the lean doctor, the good-natured Don Quixote. So he was well-known, well-respected, well-liked, and appeared to have a good personality and a good 
like a good human being. His reported net worth in 1846 was around $500,000. So in today's money, that's over $20 million. So he also was not poor. <clears throat> the second person of interest in this saga is a man named John White Webster. Now, John was born on the 20th of May, 1793 in Boston as well, to Redford and Hannah Webster. John was well-connected by both family and profession. His grandfather had been a successful merchant. <clears throat> His mother, Hannah, was a member of the Leverett family, and apparently the Leverett's were members of like one of the great Harvard College dynasties. He was a descendant of John Leverett, an early governor of Massachusetts during the Bay Colony era. Um, so John was, you know, also from a prominent family. He was friends with Robert Gold Shaw, and his pastor was Reverend Francis Parkman Sr., the brother of George. Now, these connections ensured that he moved in short. Sorry, words are hard. I can't hardly really even speak. <clears throat> Sorry. The connections to society ensured that he moved securely within this socially connected, exclusive, well-educated, privileged circle. He also graduated from Harvard College in 1811, and then in 1814 was among the founders of the Linnean Society of New England. Now, the Linnean or Linnean Society of New England was established in Boston, and its theory was to promote natural history. This society organized a natural history museum and also arranged lectures for its members. John was appointed cabinet keeper of the society's quickly growing collection of specimens that they kept in a building in Boston. Around 1815, John went to London to further his study. At Guy's Hospital, he was a surgeon's pupil, a physician's pupil, and a surgeon's dresser. He then went to San Miguel Island in the Azores, and there he practiced medicine. He published his first book, and he met the daughter of Thomas Hickley, the American vice counsel on the island. Harriet Frederica Hickley married John on May 16, 1818, and they went on to have four daughters. Um, eventually, they returned to Boston, and John went into private medical practice. But he was less successful than George had been by a long shot. And in fact, his lack of success prompted him to change careers. He used his connections to the um, Linnaean Society to become a lecturer. So he would go to places like Harvard and charge an admission to a lecture he was giving and collect the ticket prices. In 1824, John was actually appointed lecturer of chemistry, mineralogy, and geology at Hartford Medical School. And three years later, he was promoted to the Irving Professorship. While in Boston, he lived with his family on Common Street. John was a popular lecturer at Harvard Medical College, being described by Oliver Wendell Holmes as, quote, pleasant in the lecture room, rather nervous and excitable, end quote. Many of John's classroom demonstrations involved some of the latest chemical discoveries. And John became known by the students with the nickname of Skyrocket Jack because of his interest in having fireworks set off when President Everett, his former classmate, classmate sorry, was inaugurated as president of the medical college. Many um, anecdotes and stories suggest that his classroom demonstrations were often enlivened by pyrotechnic drama and um, at one time, the president of Harvard warned that sometimes his demonstrations um, could become dangerous. And um, if an accident occurred, it would be bad, I guess is what he was saying. All right. Our third and final main role goes to Ephraim Littlefield. Now, very little is known about Ephraim before his life in Boston. All I could find was that he came to Boston from a north northern New England farm. 
and he was looking for a better life. He did not want to be a farmer. Instead, he became the janitor at the new Harvard Medical College built in 1846 on the land purchased from George. Okay, remember? Ephraim had been the janitor at the previous medical college as well, and he and his wife Caroline lived in the basement of the medical college right next door to Professor John Webster's laboratory. <clears throat> so Ephraim knew John and the other Harvard doctors, um, if well, if not only by sight, right? Like he knew who they were, they knew who he was, that kind of thing. They probably were not considered friends because socially that would not have been the thing, right? But anyway, they knew who each other were. Um, Ephraim regularly observed the professors and doctors in their study of medicine, including the dissection of the cadavers during the anatomy classes. In fact, Ephraim was a, quote, resurrection man. Now, we talked about this in a previous episode, but during this time, medical students had to provide their own cadavers at medical school for their anatomy classes. Well, a resurrection man is somebody who obtains bodies for dissection during anatomy and sells them to the students for dollars, right? Um, there was not specific evidence that Ephraim was a grave robbing resurrection man, but he um, did provide medical students with human cadavers for their anatomy classes for a fee. So where he got them, well, your guess is as good as mine and we're probably right on the nose, right? Anyways, um, as the janitor though, Ephraim cleaned the doctor's rooms and the laboratories. He started the fires to warm the laboratories and he really kind of did whatever they asked him to do, whatever needed cleaning up or whatever. He, he was in charge of that. Now, these three men, George, John, and Ephraim, were acquaintances, and George and Ephraim were even colleagues. And their involvement in a murder was unbelievable and created huge waves in their social circle. On November 22nd, 1849, the week before Thanksgiving, George went to Harvard looking for John. It seemed that John owed him money for rent. And in his normal, you know, daily um, pattern, George walked to the college to attempt to collect that rent. This time, though, he actually stopped at the cashier and um, asked the college cashier to pay him whatever money was in John's account that he had received as payments for the lectures. So he must have been substantially behind on his rent <clears throat> because George was able to convince the cashier at the college to pay him from John's account. So later that day, John actually went and visited George at his home and then suggested that they meet at the medical college that afternoon around 1.30. At 1.30 p.m., George was seen entering the college on North Grove Street wearing a dark frock coat, dark trousers, and a purple satin vest with his traditional stovepipe hat. And some said it was like 1.30, some said it was 1.45, so in that 15-minute time frame, he was seen. And as far as anyone knows, that was the last time he was ever seen alive. That evening, Ephraim, the janitor, attempted to enter John's rooms at the medical school to light the evening fires, but the doors were locked from inside and Ephraim could hear water running. Um, odd, but not distressing. Okay, so Ephraim walks away, leaves the area, goes on to his next task. John was seen at 6 p.m. that evening at the party of, um, so at a friend's home at a party and was showing no signs of distress, anxiety. Um, he just was kind of being himself, you know, hanging out this this friend's house. Um, fast forward a couple of days. On the 24th of November, George's family, assumably his wife and children, 
um, have not seen for, seen him for two days, and they start making very anxious inquiries um, at the college, and then they call the police. George was not in the habit or pattern of leaving his home and not returning for days on end. This was way outside his norm. Also on the 24th, Ephraim noted that he saw John carrying a bundle wrapped in a potato sack. And when they ran into each other, John actually sent Ephraim in to make a fire. The next day on the 25th, John appeared outside the college and he met a man named James Henry Blake. This is George's nephew and a police officer, um, Officer Tren Trenholm. <clears throat> they asked him if he had seen George. And that afternoon, John also went to George's brother, the Reverend Francis Parkman, and um, Presumably to, you know, I'm so sorry your brother's missing kind of thing, right? But at this meeting, he informed the reverend that he had met up with, with George after he obtained $483.64 to pay toward his debt. Now... What we find out later is that John didn't give that money to George. George got it from the cashier. Okay. But John told the Reverend and the family that George had told him he was going to go right away and have the payment recorded by the city clerk to clear the debt. So it has to have been something to do with property, whether it was rent or taxes, who knows? I'm not sure why the city clerk would have to, to register it to clear it, but anyway. Um, I didn't look into that because that's a minor detail. <laughs> um, John then left the Parkman home and the whole time he was there, he never said, Hey, how goes the search? Anybody found George? Any signs? What's going on? So he made a point of going there and mentioning that he had seen George on the day that he was last seen and that he had given him money and that George was going to go to the city clerk. Okay. But, like I said, the records already show that the cashier, he was actually a man named Mr. Petey, P-E-T-T-E-E, -E -E, um, came, came forward and said that he had actually paid George. So I'm not sure what John thought he was going to be able to prove here. Um, clearly, he did not know that George had been given the money from his um, account at the school. <clears throat> anyway. On November 26th, a $3,000 reward was um, announced for anybody who found George alive. The family had 28,000 copies of a wanted poster printed up and distributed. And then later, that same time period, I don't know if it was the same day or the next day, they said that there was a $1,000 reward offered for George's body. So they've started to come to the conclusion that George may no longer be alive. <clears throat> On November 27th, John went to work at the college in the evening. The city was just buzzing with speculation. And at this time, there were over a hundred periodicals, like, you know, daily newspapers and magazines that um, were printing stories of the missing George. And in some of these periodicals, um, the, Irish, the Irish immigrants were blamed. I, I don't know. I don't know why they blamed it on the Irish immigrants, but they did. Um, others believe that John had just left the family, left his city, left the family, and went away. Other people believed he'd been beaten up for the money that he was known to always have on him. There were unsigned letters mailed from Boston that proposed various scenarios as to George's disappearance. So at this time, the city um, marshal, a man named Francis Tukey, had just created the Charles River and Boston Harbor area police um, regiments, right? So he sent the police, the newly formed police officer or police um, squad, there we go, to drag the Charles River and Boston Harbor. And they sent police officers into the neighboring towns 
They sent search parties um, day and night. They went into George's buildings, the ones that were rented out, the ones that were vacant. They even looked at abandoned buildings that George did not own. And nothing was found. And there was a police officer named Dorastus Clapp. And him and some of the officers um, started searching more of George's buildings and his offices and things. And every time they came back, they had this idea that they were missing something right under their nose. And they continued to return to Harvard College and they continued to return to George's buildings, but they just couldn't find anything that indicated George had been there. Even though, even though John said they met up. Okay, they just couldn't find anything. So Ephraim started to get nervous. And, and some people thought that he may be responsible for the disappearance of George. And he was nervous. He was suspicious. But also he noticed, and maybe this was why he was acting nervous and suspicious, was that John was behaving really oddly. Um, a few days after the disappearance of George, John and Ephraim met in the street and John asked Ephraim if he had seen George at the college the previous week. Um, Ephraim said he had on Friday around 1.30 and John banged his cane on the ground and then asked him if he'd seen George anywhere in the building after 1.30 or if George had been in John's own lecture room after 1.30. So Ephraim answers no to those questions. John repeated the story of having met him in the evening to pay off the debt and then walked away. Now, this was weird to Ephraim because this was longer than any conversation he had had with John in all of his years at Harvard. So Ephraim's kind of going, what? And then he's remembering that four days before George's disappearance, John asked him a number of questions about the dissecting vault, the place where they had their cadavers for their human anatomy class. And asked him things about what had been searched by the police at the college. And after this conversation, um, John showed up to Ephraim's house and gave him a turkey for Thanksgiving dinner, something he'd never before done. So Ephraim's starting to go, this guy's asking me questions that are kind of leading about what the police searched. And he's also talking to me more than he's ever spoken to me like more than just, hey, light the fires in the office kind of thing. Hey, clean that, sweep that up thing. He's actually having conversations with Ephraim, which is way outside the norm. <clears throat> so on November 28th, John was at the college really early, like much earlier than normal. And Ephraim watched under the door. So apparently the gap under the door was large enough that when Ephraim looked, he could see as high up as George's or as John's knees. So Ephraim um, noted that John went back and forth from the furnace to the fuel closet, making eight trips from the fuel closet to the furnace and back. And later that day, John's furnace was burning so hard and so, so strong that the opposite, like the back side of the wall was hot to the touch. When John left, Ephraim let himself into that room through a window because all of the doors were shut from the, were locked from the inside. He found that the kindling barrels were empty, even though he himself had recently filled them all up. And there were wet spots that tasted like acid. I am so completely grossed out that this man is walking through a medical dissection lab and he's licking things to see what they taste like. Ugh, so grossed out. Anyway, on November 29th, which was Thanksgiving day, Ephraim actually borrowed a hatchet, a drill, a crowbar, and a mortar chisel and in, in, got his wife to come stand guard. And while she was standing guard, he began to chisel away 
the wall underneath John's private lab bathroom. So in his lab, he had a private bathroom. And Ephraim went down a tunnel into the vault where the wall had felt hot and began to hack at it where the bathroom emptied into the pit. So like the septic kind of area. And the police had not searched there though. The police had not searched the septic. So he went through layers of brick, um, through two layers of brick in just over an hour and then stopped to go to a dance. So he and his wife went to a dance and he planned to return the next day and go through the remaining layers. So on November 30th, he did just that. Ephraim re resumed chiseling and he worked for quite some time until he managed to punch a hole into the wall. And at that point, he felt like this really strong draft come through, like the, the air rushed through and his lantern would not even stay lit. So he had to maneuver the lantern around to a spot where he could block the breeze and light it. And while he's doing this, all he can smell is this foul, nasty smell. So he's letting his eyes adjust to the less light and the dark. And then he sees something that is completely out of the ordinary, even in the sewer pit of a bathroom. <clears throat> um, he kind of did a double take, as you would imagine. And sitting on top of a mound of dirt was the shape of a human pelvis. And then he saw a dismembered thigh and the lower part of a leg. Now, having worked in the medical dissection lab and having worked as a cadaver provider for the medical students, Ephraim knew what he was, ex what he was seeing. So he exited his tunnel and ran to the home of another professor, a man named Jacob Bigelow. Um, Jacob went and found Marshall Tukey, the, um, police off the police chief, um, Marshall Tukey got there, but by the time he got there, um, many other people had heard what was going on and there was people just there watching and waiting and just hanging out. So there was a whole party of men who were waiting for an official report on the identity of the body parts that Ephraim had found. So Marshall, Marshall Tukey had Ephraim go through the, um, dissection room and inventory all of the specimens that they had on their catalogs to make sure nothing was missing. So the first thing he wants to do as is eliminate this as just another one of the cadavers, right? Then several men went through the tunnel and toward the vault and they decided, and man, talk about the wrong day to be, uh, have an an anomaly. They decided that the man with the longest arms would go closest to the bathroom and then hand things out, right? So the unlucky long-armed individuals handed out the pelvis, then the right thigh, and then the lower left leg. And all of these pieces were placed on a board to wait for the arrival of the coroner, a man named Jabez Pratt. So Marshal Tukey and Officer Clapp and a couple of other constables from the area take John Webster from his home in Cambridge and they took him without telling him he was under arrest. But when they got him to the jail, they charged him for the murder of George. Now, John denied any knowledge of the crime, but when he was told what Ephraim found and where he found it, he exclaimed, quote, that villain, I am a ruined man. And then he went to blame the janitor claiming that only the two of them had access to that bathroom, the man who cleaned it and the man who dirtied it. John then went silent. He sat in his cell. He was noted to be um, sweaty and trembling. So a little bit on the nervous side, which you could say was the mark of an innocent man or a guilty man. Later, after having been attended to by a medical professional, he, um, he admitted that the trembling and the sweating was because he took strychnine. But instead of killing him, it only made him sick. And I think this is a good place to pause our story.
So like I said in the beginning, this story is long, like I have 11 pages of notes long, typed pages of notes on a normal font, typed pages of notes. And I think right now we're sitting like in the middle of page five. So it's almost exactly half of the story. There are a lot of things about this story that made it fascinating for me, which we'll talk about next week. Um, but I, I tried adjusting the speed of the video. And even if I went like the full video footage length, I still did not have enough time to tell the story in one video, which I am not a huge fan of cliffhangers. I know that um, sometimes you get into the story and then you don't want to, you don't want to put a pause on it. But I also know that when I pull up my YouTube feed and there's a video that's an hour long, I have to make sure that I have time to invest in that. And I appreciate so much the time you take to watch the videos I make that I do not want to take advantage of that or waste your time, even though it's a really good story. I don't think it's a waste of time, but I know you have to choose. And sometimes you don't have time to choose a one hour um, video. So to finish off the card, I'm adding some um, bling that I got from Honeybee Stamps. These are the ombre, let me see if I can find the right name for them, ombre pearl stickers. So these are flat backed pearls that have adhesive already on them. And this particular set has, their, each pearl is two-tone. So I found the ones that were both green and pink kind of fading into each other, which was kind of perfect for this card. And I am going hog wild with them. I put three on the sentiment strip. I'm putting three down here by this leaf in the lower left corner. And then I decided that was an even number, so I had to add more. So I'm adding another grouping of three up at the top left. So it kind of sort of makes a triangle. So visual triangle, check. Odd number groups, check. And odd number gems, check. So we're going to go ahead and zoom in here so you can see a little bit. I hope I get to pick up those um, bling on camera. And then we'll zoom back out and you can see the card in its entirety. I really do appreciate you hanging out with me today. Um, I really appreciate you hanging out with me every time you come to watch a video. I've added a couple other videos here that I think you might like. I've also added that subscribe button. If you haven't subscribed, I would love it if you did. Give it a thumbs up. Tell YouTube you like the video so maybe other people will get to watch it as well. And um, leave me a comment down below. Tell me if you'd watch the hour video and have a great day.